Tonight we are continuing our study of the Apostles and the Nicene Creeds, what Christians believe, and um, we're picking up with this phrase, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. That's what the Apostles' Creed says. The Nicene says, he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. So before I, I jump in, I would like to point out to you that what we've looked at so far in what the creeds say about Jesus has focused on his divinity, on his being God. Um, God of God, light of light, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father by whom all things were created. I mean, this is a focus on his divinity. What we're doing now in the, in the very next sentence, um, or even the next phrase, the focus shifts to his humanity. What we're going to look at tonight is Jesus the man, Jesus the human being, and what happened when God became one of us and remains one of us. So it's interesting to me that in the creeds, both of them, having announced the birth of Jesus, incarnate by the Virgin Mary, it both creeds completely skip over his entire life, his entire ministry, his teaching, his miracles, all of that, nothing. It goes straight from born of the Virgin Mary to suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. It, it goes from his birth to the last three or four days of his life. And, and I would suggest the reason for that is because everything else he said and did were signposts and instructions and pointing to what he was going to accomplish in his death and resurrection. What Jesus did in those three days is why he came into the world. John the Baptist said it best in John 19, 30, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he suffered under Pontius Pilate. I just want to touch on that. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I find it interesting that other than the Blessed Virgin Mary and Jesus himself, Pilate is the only one that gets mentioned in the, in the creeds. And Dad Gummit, if he doesn't get a bad mention, um, he he he's the bad guy. He's the you know he's the he's the outlaw in this movie, um, and 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 it's unfortunate because he didn't torture Jesus. He didn't crucify Jesus. But because of political expediency. He didn't stand up for Jesus either. So here's what happens. He, he was, if you want the history, the facts, he was the, the governor of Judea from 26 to 36 for 10 years under the Roman Empire. He represented Rome. And, uh, and he was always in his life playing the political game, the game of intrigue, the try to make sure you're on the right side and you gain the favor of the powerful people. And... Um, that's what happens in this crucifixion scene. Pilate had no intention of killing Jesus. He thought, we'll give him a good flogging, satisfy the crowd, let him go. And the crowd cried out for his blood. Crucify him, crucify him. In Matthew 27, it says, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. So Pilate did the cowardly thing, the unmanly thing, the political thing, 
And as a result of that, for 2,000 years, everybody knows his name. And his name is forever etched in our confession of faith. That this man was a coward. That this man was a betrayer in a sense. The creed says he suffered and was crucified. He suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified. So the question has come up for hundreds of years. Who is responsible for the death of Jesus? And unfortunately, some people say the Jews. And in fact, there's this ugly, sordid thread of history in Christianity where Christians have persecuted, murdered, driven out of the country Jews, all in the name of these are Christ killers, which is malarkey. Yes, the Jewish leadership was involved in getting rid of Jesus. You could say it was the Romans' fault. The Romans were the ones that actually did the nailing and hoisting him up on the cross. Um, but here's what the scriptures say. Isaiah 53, a prophecy about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities, carried our sorrows, Yet we considered, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I'm not going to delve into the, the soteriology, the, the understanding of salvation in that text. that I, I did that in my book, Salvation and How We Got It Wrong, and you can watch the videos or you can read the book on that. This is not saying God punished Jesus instead of us. But Jesus willfully took all of our fallenness, all of our shortcomings, everything that, that, that from our perspective separated us from the love of God, Jesus willingly took all of that into himself and took it with him to the cross. So who's who put Jesus on the cross? You might say all of humanity did, including you and me, Adam, everybody from Adam to us and everybody in between. But I'm going to take it one step further and say what happened on that day was no accident. Jesus dying on the cross was Acts 2, 23, the definite, by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Who put Jesus on the cross? God did. But wait a minute. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father. I'm not saying the Father said, Son, I'm going to torture you instead of them. No, that's heresy, I think. But what happens here is a picture of the one and only true God so loving us that he gives himself, that he sacrifices himself. If there's someone that you desperately love, that you love with all your heart, that you love more than life itself, and you see them in some situation where they are about to die, you know, it's a little five-year-old kid about to run out in front of a bus. And in that split moment, you have the decision to make. I can throw myself out there and save this one I love. This is what God does in the sacrifice of himself. He saves us by sacrificing himself. He is a self-offering. And so a couple of passages I'd like to read to you. 
<clears throat> John chapter 10, verse 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Pilate didn't take it from him. The Roman soldiers didn't take it from him. Adam or you and nobody else took his life from him. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. And later, that same author, John, who's telling us what Jesus said, says in 1 John chapter 3, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. What put him on the cross? Love. And God is love. This whole thing was a movement of love. And so we have here the sacrifice the self-sacrifice of the one true God. But, but, but think about this for a minute. The sacrifice of the one who made everything. He made the iron of the nails that were driven through his wrist. He made the tree that he was hung on, the wood that he was hung on. And here he is, becoming one with what he has made, and even so much to the point of yielding himself to death through the very things and ones that he made. To what end? Why the cross? Jesus died, was crucified, died, dead and buried. Jesus was crucified and he died to deal once and for all, for all people, for all time, for all of creation, to deal once and for all with the sin that was separating us from God. Not that God was looking for his pound of flesh, no, but Christ gave himself, God sacrificed himself in order to draw us near him. Here's what the scriptures say. Romans chapter 6, verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Book of Hebrews chapter 7. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And again, two chapters later, chapter 9 in the book of Hebrews but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the death of Jesus, the whole world stands reconciled to God. And you all know what I'm about to say. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. That's not me, that's St. Paul. Which leads St. Peter to say, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved. The, the, he, Christ is the only way to salvation, but that doesn't make it only a few. He's the only way to salvation for all, for the whole of creation. He reconciles us all to himself. So, he was crucified. We just talked about that. Dead. Interestingly, both creeds say he was dead. Like he didn't swoon. It wasn't like that Monty Python skit where, you know, he's only sort of, no, that's Princess Bride. He's only sort of dead. Um, 
the point in the creed is as a human being, he died dead, really dead, as dead as any human being has ever died. As a man, he died the death of a human, not swooning, not halfway dead, not kind of dead, dead. Whatever dead means, dead happened to Jesus. And he was buried. His body was laid in a tomb as a dead body. It was St. Gregory of Nyssa, 4th century, said, At Christ's death, his soul was separated from his body. Being crucified on a Friday, he's laid in a tomb. He gets a kind of Sabbath rest on that Saturday, on that Sabbath. And we're not going to get to the resurrection tonight. But I do want to end by pointing out one more thing and then by reading you a rather lengthy text of Scripture. We are told in the Scriptures that it was a borrowed tomb. And you all know Joseph of Arimathea was the owner. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. And he came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. This is Luke 23. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, placed it in a tomb cut in a rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. It was a borrowed tomb, or as someone has humorously said, Jesus only needed it for the weekend. Final thing. In Peter's first great sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 26, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, and you know yourselves. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Next week. Freeing him from the agony of death. You see, he died to defeat death. First for himself and then for us, but I'm getting ahead of the story. Freeing him from the agony of death, Peter said, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Continuing, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what was ahead, David spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. Peter said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Jesus really died because Jesus was really a human. But as Peter said, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
And that's what we're saying when we say he was crucified, dead, and buried. Amen.